this time on Colores. Pueblo storyteller Larry Littlebird shares the importance of learning to listen. Listening to what's within is what the stories are, are really, truly about. Julie Seltzer is writing out an entire Torah, a sacred Jewish text, only the second written by a woman. I don't think of joy and hard work as being separated. It's also an opportunity to be more quiet in a world that often feels very rushed and loud and overwhelming. Intersecting politics, graphic design, and painting, Don Harvey has been making art in spaces where opposite worlds collide. If I connected it to a sort of activism, it was an attitude about what the city looked like uh, or could look like and what design meant. Pixar Films animator Sanjay Patel has a unique personal portfolio, drawing on his East Indian heritage to illustrate ancient Hindu epics. There's magic, there's fighting and animals and gods and demons that I just thought, like, I really want to tell a story in the most modern and graphic way as possible. It's all ahead on Colores. Pueblo storyteller Larry Littlebird shares what stories are truly about. Where do stories come from? Where do stories come from? Oh my God. <laughs> That's where they come from. Oh my God. And there's nothing more creative in being with the Creator than telling a story because the Creator loves stories. And that brings that relationship to where it should be, like a, like a father or a mother with their child. Mm -hmm. That is so uh, essential to what a story is. How are stories connected to the land? This right here, this is the listening ground. And so wherever I am on the earth, I'm one with that ground. So I'm grounded. People who have separated from any kind of indigenous association or root, it's difficult because the, the technology just draws them away from the moment. And that's really all we have. We have these moments. And again, the, the beautiful thing about stories is learning to listen. Mm -hmm. That's the beautiful thing about stories. Mm -hmm. There's a, a resonance that, that we, we vibrate with. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a sound. Sounds come to us and they touch us. Why stories? Why is stories the medium? Listening to what's within is what the stories are, are really, truly about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people call me a storyteller, and I, I completely refuse that. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people think that because they hear me uh, share lots of stories that I've got some kind of brilliant memory it has nothing to do with memory. It has to do with listening. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed to ha have had elders my entire life who, were, who I was close to, who I, who I could just listen to. How I understand myself is that I'm more of a story listener. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I get to share some stories. And it allows me to listen one more time to a story. Mm. Yeah, it's my voice, but I'm remembering where it came from mm -hmm. and how it was shared. The greatest thing that as Native people that we're, we're about is our trauma. I had people 
but I, I paid attention to whatever they might be saying to me. And that learning to listen has allowed me to not get fear, become fearful about the trauma, yeah. but to look at it, see what it is, and then remember a story. Wow. And the stories come for that very purpose, to help us find our way mm. through any darkness. They become like a light. As a poet, I often people are always like, you know, so it's so cool you get to go up there and talk and people get to listen to you and they get to like hear your voice and that must be so like emancipating. But for every one poem I, I put out there, I get five or six in return. And that's, that's the rewarding part. As a poet, there's a, there's a magic in being able to gather people and having people come together in relationship, as you called it. What would happen if there were no listeners? Look at our world now. Hmm. There are very few listeners, but there's a great deal of chaos. Now, doesn't mean that chaos, chaos has to be uh, harmful, because you can actually put some incredible stuff together. But there's a tendency for humans to become very confused very easily, because that's what happens to us. And that chaos can, leave, can, can lead to destructiveness, a destructiveness which is saying that, oh, I'm just not any good. Hmm. I'm not any good. Hmm. And we are nothing but good. <laughs> How do you know it's the end of the story? Oh, that's a cool question, because you're, you're talking filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And if you don't see the end of the story, you could be working on that for a long, long time. <laughs> see, you're describing literature. Mm -hmm. In the oral, it's not mm -hmm. quite like that. Mm -hmm. But for a moment, we're speaking yeah. shop here. Mm -hmm. The ending is because that's what is touching you. Mm. That's what you're feeling, and that's what you're hearing, and that's what you're seeing. You made a distinction between kind of oral culture mm -hmm. and literature, but can you tell us a little more about this oral quality, this oral characteristic? In the beginning was the word. <laughs> that's it. And here we are. Right. And here and we it are. always comes back to that. It yeah. always circles around. Yeah, here we are. What, what happens to us as humans is we, we get caught in our own descriptions. Hmm. And yet we're in this word, but we're not quiet to hear what this word is saying. Julie Seltzer makes history one ancient letter at a time as a female scribe. Tata de Beret, Kola Sheratzavecha. וארון אחיך ידבר אל פרעה, ושילח את בני ישראל מארצו. You shall repeat all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh to let the Israelites depart from his land. I generally say or sing or chant a prayer or a line to get in a ready state and a focused state um, with, with the right intention. Julie Seltzer is a soferet, or scribe, performing a tradition that has been passed down for thousands of years. A feather quill, bottle of ink, and 62 sheets of parchment are all she needs to create a sacred Torah. A scroll uh, of the Torah uh, is probably the oldest continuous document that humanity has. And the Torah scroll, that is the handwritten scroll of the five books of Moses, uh, represents God's wisdom and what human beings need to know in order to be human beings. For someone to take on the sacred, holy responsibility of writing a Torah uh, is an extraordinary commitment. I don't think of joy and hard work as being 
separated. It's also an opportunity to be more quiet in a world that often feels very rushed and loud and overwhelming. The, the scribe uh, is governed by elaborate rules for how the scribe would copy a Torah, including the number of letters in each book and the number of paragraphs and the number of columns. And they're all checked and double checked to make sure that the Torah that we read in the synagogue today is to the best of human capabilities, flawless and exactly like the one God, according to legend, gave Moses on Mount Sinai that was written in black fire on white fire. So this is one of my favorite letters, the letter Pei. While it's a Pei with the black ink in the, the formation of the letter, what you see on the inside in the, the white space is actually another Hebrew letter, it's the Bet. I read the words and then I say them and then I write them. It helps the scribe to not make errors. Though she is following centuries old scribal rules, Julie is actually breaking with tradition in two ways. She is a woman in a field dominated by male scribes. And instead of a scribe's customary solitude, Julie is writing her Torah in public view at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. According to traditional Jewish law, only a Torah that's written by an adult Jewish male will be kosher for use. So this is why women haven't historically been scribes. Barred from traditional scribal schools because of her gender, Julie looked online and found a teacher willing to train a woman. The Torah that Julie is writing for us will be the second Torah ever written by a woman. Twenty years ago, it was not common to find very many female rabbis. And things have really changed and progressed. And so I'm hoping in 20 years, it will not be unusual to have a female scribe. For Julie, being commissioned to write a Torah was a dream come true. But performing a spiritual act in public is proving a bit of a challenge. I don't know of any other museum who's really, over a year period, had somebody, in a sense, on view doing their work. There are artists who, as part of a performance piece, their work includes people and interaction but not something that's trying to produce something that then will be sacred and used. So we really have been struggling with how to balance the interest of our visitors with the needs of Julie as she writes the Torah. When she first started, visitors used to come right up to Julie to peer over her shoulder. Now her space is cordoned off and a live video projection offers a voyeuristic view of her hand at work. Regularly scheduled breaks allow visitors the chance to ask their most burning questions. I'm just wondering, I, I'm sure there are times when there are mistakes made, and I'm just curious about how you, how you fix those mistakes. Thank you for recognizing that certainly there would be mistakes. The biggest myth is that a scribe can't make any mistakes, and if you make a mistake, you have to start the whole Torah over, which I think is kind of a remarkable um, myth, simply because people actually believe it, which is amazing. Because something is holy, it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to stay away from it, because holiness is also about coming close to something. So for me, that's what's amazing, um, to be able to share that process. I get to be very close to the Torah as I'm, as I'm writing it, and um, people, as they watch, can also be part of that, that process. Before she became a scribe, Julie was a baker for a Jewish retreat center. She would often shape ritual breads into her favorite scenes from the Torah. I've made everything from a scene of people getting swallowed up by the earth. It was a giant mound challah ripped apart with little people flailing about, to ritual objects, and this year is based on scribal oddities or interesting things connected to a scribe's work. So it's usually words or other things connected to how Torah is written. As part of her residency at the museum, Julie is combining her dual passions for baking and scribal arts by conducting food for thought workshops for visitors. So we're going to be making hamantashen, but that's not um, the only thing that we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about um, the holiday of Purim. After studying a passage from the Torah, the class gathers in the museum's kitchen to make baked goods related to that portion of the text. I love doing 
baking workshops and sessions because it's a way for people to connect with Torah with an easier entryway than the text and everyone gets to participate and everyone gets to learn through doing. Taking time to interact with the public has its rewards, but at this point, Julie's beginning to feel the pressure of completing the Torah. She's about a third of the way through and must finish by December. At the rate of one column a day, the work is painstaking and precise. Kind of like if you're gonna run a marathon, you have the training schedule, and if you follow the schedule, you'll be ready to run the marathon. So I have my Torah schedule, and if I write the amount that I need to write every day, then I'll complete it on time, God willing. Right around the corner from Julie's desk, visitors can lift a cloth to see a few of the sheets completed so far. Eventually, they will be bound together into one scroll and offered to a community in need of a Torah. One of the great things about um, learning about the Torah is that they're always done anonymously. So there's only 304,805 letters. It does not allow you to sign your name to the Torah. We'll be sending this Torah out in the world to be used and eventually no one will even know that Julie wrote this Torah because it will just be one of the Torahs being used by a congregation somewhere who will really um, read it and use it as a sacred object and who wrote it is not important but it will have a new life as a living document. In the film by Ted Sikora, artist Don Harvey applies principles of environmentalism and his critique of the status quo to his paintings. Yeah, so basically it's just oil paint with some medium in it, a little bit of dryer in it. And it's on a watercolor paper that has a sort of uh, plasticized surface. So it doesn't absorb the oil and the pigment right away and I can move it. I just like to have a little bit of density and suggestion of space behind these so that it suggests ways to me to begin to build the collage on top. When I first moved to Cleveland, a friend of mine said, you know, the thing you'll find is that Cleveland's small enough that if you want to accomplish something, you can do it and you can find people to work with. And it's big enough that people might hear about what you're doing outside of Cleveland. And I pretty much found that to be true. The urban landscape, the industrial forms, all the stuff that everybody talks about. I was just constantly amazed that I could look one way and see industrial refuse and then look down by the river and see migratory birds or see turtles or whatever kinds of things were happening there. If I connected it to a sort of activism, it was an attitude about what the city looked like uh, or could look like and what design meant. You know, I was experiencing a lot of uh, people whose attitude about the city was that you came in and maybe there was nothing really there worth preserving, so you tear it down and put something new in its place, or you would take something old and uh, dress it up in its own clothing, but it would be so dressed up that you didn't recognize its age anymore. It was kind of like a building imitating itself in a way. The pieces I'm working on now are things that I've uh, drawn or designed in the computer that are collage parts. Some of them start with photo imagery like this one did, and then I go through whatever manipulations it seems to need in the computer. Some of the parts are parts that I've drawn and scanned in. I'll print out paint and cut out and collage in. Sometimes I paint directly on the backgrounds. All the work is sort of, I guess, a cynical political edge to it, some sort or the other. Sometimes it's just sort of anti-establishment, and sometimes it's sort of openly political. And if I say political, I don't mean party politics or something like that. It's not about trying to change somebody else's mind. It's about trying to say where you are and put your voice in the conversation. And hopefully, like all politics, if enough voices join together, then, then something does happen. Well, it's not meant to change somebody's mind, although I hope sometimes I might piss them off. Pop artist and Pixar animator Sanjay Patel illustrates adaptations of ancient Hindu epics. We're working on a uh, series of shorts based on Mater's character called Cars Tunes. And uh, in this particular short, they actually are uh, big monster trucks and they end up sort of in this big wrestling match. 
Pixar Studios in Emeryville is known for bringing innovation and emotion to the world of computer animated films. Popular films like Toy Story, Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, and Ratatouille have garnered the studio 22 Academy Awards. Now a lead animator at Pixar, Sanjay Patel was still a student when he was recruited by the fledgling company almost 14 years ago. He was studying in the animation program at Cal Arts in Los Angeles. That program was started by Walt Disney himself to train his animators, and so I started making 2D animations. Toy Story had been released, and they had brought it to CalArts, and as students, we saw it, and I was just blown away with the sophistication of it and the sophistication of the storytelling. And so I put down my pencil and no longer draw at Pixar. I have to use my mouse, and I use 3D animation software. Essentially, we have this car that's been built by uh, the modelers, and these models are very elaborate uh, puppets, and uh, we have controls to uh, move the puppet around and create different positions and different expressions. I could just sort of move this control, and he could move his tire and hit McQueen. Move the upper lip up down, even uh, their eyelids. When I picked up the scene, I actually had them looking a little bit sort of too angry. And the director actually pulled me back, and he was thinking that, you know what? These characters are best friends, and they're actually, actually having fun just playing tag. I ended up having to ch sort of change the expression to reflect that. And that's the end of what I do in terms of animation. And then it gets handed off to lighting and rendering. And here's how the scene looks with shadows and colors. Pixar is incredibly supportive of people doing outside work. Uh, there's all kinds of classes that people could take here at Pixar. There's painting classes, there's drawing classes, there's sculpture classes. And I think they really encourage that, you know, you really need to renew yourself as an artist to be able to come back and sort of work under such pressure and intensity on these films. If there's anything that Pixar espouses, it's just this absolute, like, church of storytelling. It really does force you to think in a very different way. I think because of that, I've been able to pursue my own stories that I want to tell. Since 2006, Patel has published his own work, lavishly illustrated interpretations of ancient Hindu mythology. His latest book is called Ramayana, Divine Loophole. The Ramayana is one of the foundational myths of Hinduism and tells the epic story of Rama, his brother Lakshman, and his wife Sita. The Ramayana is such a neat story because it's all adventure, plot, and actions, and there's magic, there's fighting, and animals, and gods, and demons, that I just thought, like, I really want to tell this story in the most modern and graphic way as possible. As Patel undertook the task of bringing to life dozens of scenes from this ancient story, he found himself using the skills he gained from his animation work at Pixar. Animating at Pixar makes me think about, well, what's the acting, and what's the sort of narrative arc that I could use for this little panel that I'm trying to draw. And it really reminds me that character moments are so important in this great mythology that I want to tell. And so I do feel like the two feed off of each other. This type of artwork would definitely be hanging around in my parents' household. And this is definitely my indoctrination and like introduction to Hinduism. I'd see stuff like this and I'd just have like, like no effing clue what, what this meant. I was raised in Southern California. My parents owned a motel in uh, San Bernardino, California. And my parents are from India. They're from a state called Gujarat. I could speak English really well, so I had to stay home and help run the motel. I would just kind of became a TV brat. And I really, in many ways, I just grew up on Amer American culture was definitely like fed to me through the, te the television, mainly through cartoons. I don't know, I could really just sort of escape my reality and I just got, became obsessed with watching cartoons, drawing cartoons, collecting comic books. I would sit there and draw for hours and hours and hours from these comics. Although Patel revered the comic book heroes of American popular culture, his relationship with the icons of his parents' Hindu faith was more complicated. Indian culture in my like, I don't know, like growing up, <laughs> I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. And my parents were raising me in a sort of bubble of their own culture inside uh, Southern California. <laughs> I wasn't exposed to the stories of the Hindu mythology or Hindu faith at all. What I was exposed to was the iconography and the imagery. But it's his perspective as an outsider that allows Patel to reclaim the iconography of his parents' culture and reimagine it for a contemporary audience.
Patel is in the midst of creating a new book based on the story of the Hindu deity Ganesha. In Patel's version of the tale, he plays off of the elephant god Ganesha's famous love of sweets. It's kind of a fun little moment, actually. This is after Ganesha uh, he actually tries biting down on the jumbo jawbreaker Ladu. And sure enough, he, uh, he breaks his tusk. And I'm trying to figure out what would be the most fun way to like, figure out how, to Gan how Ganesh might re react, like, oh, no. So I was thinking maybe he'd be crying over here. <laughs> Growing up, I always felt disconnected from uh, my American friends simply because like, I was Indian, my skin was brown. Uh, from my Indian friends, I felt disconnected in different ways because I was an artist. And so I was just felt outside in all these ways. And finally, I found the thing that actually brought everything that I liked together. What I'd like to think is actually I found my voice. And this voice is something that feels really relevant to me, and really important and really good. I just know so clearly that I'm going to be doing this till I, the day I die. Next time on Colores. Social arts practitioner Naomi Natali of One Million Bones confronts the global issue of genocide. You move forward with this understanding and this respect that if we belong to each other, then we're responsible to one another. And what does that responsibility mean? The Progress of Love is an international exhibit that focuses on the different stages of romance, from infatuation to passion to heartbreak. This is really heightening the idea that, you know, cultures need rituals um, to perform acts like grief. Technical director for Cirque du Soleil's Arcana, David Churchill, explains the intricacies of preparing the show set. I'm sort of like the conduit between crazy and reality, and we try to take the crazy ideas and turn them into reality as much as we can. Walt Courier incorporates his Native American culture into his art, strengthening local community and offering guidance to kids. My philosophy of the art is more on uh, that cultural side of it, expressive, making an impact. Until next time, thank you for watching.